Her son remained calm as the judge read the sentence, death by execution. Josue Flores was murdered last Tuesday on his way home from school. I had a nightmare the other night. It was so real. It just like the world was dead. I told him I was crazy. Officers tell us Trujillo stabbed her boyfriend with stiletto heel shoes. Police say the suspect may be responsible for the murders of at least six women whose bodies have been found in or near the Acres Homes area. Defense attorneys had argued that Yates was legally insane and grossly psychotic when she drowned the children. One by one, they described the deaths of the alleged other eight victims of the convicted rail car killer. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Evidence Room. This is a single episode that we're doing before we launch our new season later this month. We're going to have a whole new look, but right now we're focusing on the murder case of Farrah Frada. And joining me is my colleague, Phil Archer. You covered this case. You covered the trial. It was uh, her estranged husband, Robert Frada. Right. I covered one of the trials, and I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm having trouble remembering if, it was it, remembering if it was his first or second. I think it was the second trial. His retrial. Which was in 2009, 2009 yeah. was yeah. the second trial. Okay, so let's kind of catch everybody up here. 1994, you have this young mother of right. three, goes to her suburban home in Atascacita, pulls into the garage, right. someone walks up, shoots her twice in the head, kills her. Right. And that just stunned everybody. What is your emergency? Yes, I just saw a shooting, please. Okay, do you know if anybody's been shot? Yes, I see the lady, I see her garage right now. Is somebody shot? Yes. Stay on the line, let me connect you with the ambulance service. Hold on. I just saw a shooting. You just saw a shooting? Yes. And what is your location? My, I'm at 5411 Timbers Trail in Atascacita. You need to send an ambulance, she's down. First of all, it's in a neighborhood where nothing like this ever happens. Yes. Yeah. To a woman who would not even be suspected of being a target for any kind of violence like that. Right. There'd be no reason mm -hmm. to target her. So it was almost immediate. I mean, I, I think I was talking with you earlier. Right. Everybody automatically started looking at Robert Frada, who went by Bob. So Bob Frada, the estranged husband, because they were about two years into a pretty right. contentious divorce. Right. Well, the, you know, the police, of course, immediately started looking for people with means and motive. And I'm not sure there really was anybody who jumped to the top of the list immediately except Robert Frada. I will never forget, they questioned him the night, naturally, and that's kind of Detective 101. Woman killed, you're going to look at close family, especially the estranged husband who's in the middle of a pretty contentious divorce and custody battle over right. the three children. So they bring him in. But one of the things that I really stood out to me was what the detective said after they questioned him <laughs> and released him. Because you and I know, whenever we've interviewed detectives before right. anybody's charged, they try to play things pretty close to the vent. John Denholm, veteran detective. Yeah. He, he made no bones about it. He's lying. He's been lying all night. You know, there's no robbery. There's no sexual assault. There's no carjacking. Uh, basically, you got a mother of three coming home from work at 8 o'clock in a low-crime affluent subdivision in northeast Harris County. Basically gets ambushed and shot execution style. The thing that has always interested me, or um, I shouldn't say it that way, not interested, but surprised me, I guess, really, about this is we're talking about a guy who's a certified police officer. He's been through the training uh, and he knows what, well, he should know, should have known what police are going to be looking at and that he was probably going to be one of their main suspects, at least one of their main suspects. If you watch the interrogation video mm -hmm. from that night, it was a detective, William Valerio, that was right. doing the interrogation that night. And they talked about that. I mean, like he knew what he was doing. He knew what his rights were. He knew right. this would go. And they point blank, you know, did you do this? 
course, he says no. But he says, you know, and I thought about that. So on the way over here, you know, geez, uh, I hope they find who did this because they're, you know, I'm going to look suspicious. So, I mean, it was, I mean, even, I'll never forget the detective in the interrogation who looks at him just went, what's wrong with this picture? Maybe she thought she was going to lose the custody of the kids. I, I'm, I'm, we're battling for custody. Yeah, right now. Right. I mean, you know, that's why I figured you had me down here. You figure I'm got something to do with it because we're battling for custody. So, um... I assume there's some kind of a custody settlement when you got your divorce. No, the, the divorce isn't finalized. I thought it was still final. When's it going to be final? No. Uh, well, it was, we're supposed to have trial, like, towards the end of the month. Did you arrange to have your wife killed? No, I did not. And I'll put it this way, too. I mean, if anything happens to her, that's one of the things I was thinking about on the way over here, is, like, what the hell am I going to do now? Who hates your wife enough to kill her? Nobody I can think of. I mean, I, I can't think of anybody that hates her. Um, What's wrong with this picture? All I can say is, Check her lifestyle. She uh, went out clubbing a lot. Got a boob job and flaunted a lot. I mean, that 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 question was so brilliant because it encapsulated so much in just a few amount of words. What's wrong with this picture? Well, you don't even have to step back if you, when you look at all of the things that were wrong with that picture. Here's a here's a trained police officer mm. who should have no who had means and motive. Uh, he. His wife was a problem for him, and he was not quiet about that. Not only, not only did he um, go after her, go after her that way, but he apparently he told everybody about it. He, they, they, yeah. this, he apparently had no valve. Uh, I mean, he he went out and tried to recruit people to help him kill her. At his gym, <laughs> and apparently it was everybody. Apparently everybody he yeah. talked to. I mean, it was it was well known that he just he wanted somebody to kill his wife. Yeah. He was he was tired of it. He said he kept telling everybody, "I'm tired of being broke. I, I'm tired of all this." And so, but but in, let's back up just for a second because when you go through the archives right. and there's all the things you know that are in there, one of the things not just. Detective 101, you suspect the estranged, you suspect, pardon me, the, the estranged husband immediately following right. her death. They also found about $1,000 in cash in his car the night of his wife's murder. And what was that for? Well, it was for new carpet. Okay. You know, but because remember, he had an alibi and, right. it, and it was true. He was at church with his three children. All right. And it, it was, I thought that was particularly sad because that forced his oldest um, to have to testify at his own father's trial. I do recall Bradley asking questions. He wanted to know, he says, Daddy, why did you have all that money in your car? Bradley was nine. He did testify in the, in the trial. What did he testify to exactly? Daddy got up twice to, to use the telephone. Well, she correlated that with the two telephone calls on his cell phone. I mean, just got, I'll never forget, talk, I mean, the, the, the burden that was put on those children. I remember talking to the social right. worker who supervised the first visits between Bob Frada and his children right after Pharaoh was, was murdered. And she said the thing that just broke everybody was his daughter, who was four at the time, pretty much walked around telling anybody who would listen that the bad guys put bullets into mommy's head. Amber was the most vocal because she was the youngest and probably didn't really understand what she was saying, but I can remember her walking around the, the office and saying to anyone who would listen, the bad guys put, put bullets in my mommy's head. The boys were, were very quiet. They didn't say much. They wanted to know when they could live with him. Amber cried when he left and wanted just one more hug. When they both turned 18, they went to visit him one time. And that was it? They asked him one question, and he didn't answer it, and they left. Well, I'm assuming the question was why? Correct. I can't understand how you can do that to a child. Meaning, like, how can your you cause, child. yeah, how you can cause pain like that to your own children. I just don't understand it. Well, in, in, as the prosecution laid out its case, there was a fair amount of evidence that suggested that Robert Frada was incredible narcissist that he didn't really feel much empathy certainly not for his ex-wife 
but uh, you could extrapolate probably the kids were uh, somewhat in that uh, category as well, that it didn't matter. What mattered was relieving him of the pain he felt he was going through with his divorce. But when I, when I say the, the plan seems a little odd, the plan is, all right, I'm going to go recruit the gym rats that I work out with to see if any of them will help me kill my wife. Right. And then we'll set it up and I'll take the kids to church and everything will be okay. Well, who, you come to the trial. These people like testified. That? But didn't any of these people go, should, maybe I should call the police here? The I'll say this. I thought prosecutors, the prosecutors didn't hammer much on that. The question all of us would ask, anyone would ask, uh, did it occur to you maybe that he was really going to go through with this and that uh, maybe you ought to bring the authorities in? They did ask those questions. They didn't embarrass them with it, with them. Uh, and the and the answers were, let's just say, lacking. That you know, some of them, I, I think. Well, they all just think that he was just blowing off steam, just spouting off, steam. Off, yeah, off. Yeah, blowing off steam. Uh, but it seems to me I remember. One, well, I won't say it because I can't remember correct uh, precisely. I, I was going to say it seems to me I remember one who um, didn't make any excuse. Just said. No, it's his business, something along those lines. Oh, wow. So, Oof. yeah, so it was. Uh, That's particularly it was, sad because it seems like there was multiple points to have prevented her murder and these children losing oh. their mother and their father by extension. Yeah, I think most of us, if we're, <laughs> we're with an acquaintance who is seriously saying he wants to kill his wife, that we would pay attention to that. Multiple times. Yeah. Not like just once. No, over and over. Like over for and weeks. over for weeks and weeks and weeks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, that was the thing. I mean, that was the thing that they brought out. I mean, it's just like he had said this so much because right. the defense tried to, I think, say, well, he was just venting. He was angry. It was a nasty divorce, custody battle kind of thing. And right. you know, it was like, no, he, when you, he, you maybe, maybe you say that once. In all, but when you over and over and over and over and over again right. do it, and it was okay. So he's he eventually comes across these these guys, Joseph Price Dash and Howard Gidry. Price, Price Dash, yes, I'm was the was the go between in the getaway driver. Right. Gidry was the uh, trigger man. When you talk about well thought out too, this was something else that struck me going through the archives, um, and you see the pictures of the the gun that was used to to kill Farah. That was Frada's gun. He, he gave the hitman a gun that he had purchased. I, yeah. I mean, in in. And I'm laughing. I mean, I, I know I it's not. I know it's it's, it's absurd. It's just but it's yeah. absurd. It, who does that? But what came out is because at first when I was going through, I was looking at there was uh, photos and evidence, and it was of a bank. I'm like, what? Why am I seeing a bank here? This has nothing to do with a bank robbery. Maybe that's where he withdrew. Right. No, turns out Gidry had been picked up for bank robbery. And he was arrested, and he used a gun in the right. bank robbery. Well, when they start putting together the whole price dash Gidry connection, they suddenly realize, hey, this gun in this serial number is in our evidence room. And it's a gun that had been bought by Robert Frada. And then, of course, you know how in jail they record phone calls, right? right? Well, they recorded some of Gidry's phone calls. And, you know, we're, we're going to... Uh, Need to take a quick break, but sure. we'll get back to some of those recorded calls between Gidry, the trigger man, okay. and, and yeah, this other you, person. I think you could say that uh, solving this crime was not the toughest nut county detectives ever had to crack. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we'll get to that when we come back. Yeah. Welcome back to the evidence room. We're talking about the murder of Farah Frada. Her estranged husband, Bob Frada, was convicted and sentenced to death for the murder of his wife, the mother of his three children. With me is Phil Archer, longtime veteran journalist <laughs> at KPRC2. We were talking about, you know, you'd said before the break, you had talked about it may not have been the toughest nut to crack. Well, it wasn't quite that easy. I mean, there was there was a lot because it was a lot of circumstantial. Yes, you had Bob Frada going around telling everybody who would listen right. he wanted to find a, a hitman. They had phone calls, but it, what it turned out was the phone calls that Frada made the night of right. the murder went to a woman's phone by the name of Mary Gipp, who turned out to be Price Dash's girlfriend. Mm. And at first, she wouldn't say anything. 
Like it took it basically took them threatening her with okay we're just right. going to charge you with Ferris murder, right? Before she was like oh wait a minute I'll talk well right she's uh, she would have been an accomplice you'd have to say uh, if yeah she didn't plan it she didn't do anything with right. it but she right. she wasn't was involved coming, in the actual yeah. carrying it out but mm-hmm. she was facilitating helping cover up right and, and I know that was a linchpin in that but, case yeah. right but what I mean it wasn't the toughest nut to crack yeah it took. It took a while to pull all the ends together to prove mm-hmm. the case. But from the get-go, there was no, as far as the cops were concerned, there was no real mystery here. They no, had no, a from pretty the good, very, from like they, the, they had a the very solid murder. suspect from the get-go. Yeah. And so they just pursued that right. as hard as they had And they to. tailed him. I mean, like, they, yeah. you, you, you go through and you see they tailed him, like, day after day after day. They knew right. what was going on. And... We had taught, and so right before the break, we were also talking about Gidry, the man who was uh, who's been convicted of being the trigger man who actually shot and killed yeah. Farah. Um, the gun was actually purchased by Friday. Well, and it was interesting because when he was in jail, he was talking to somebody, and you know how they record those phone calls in jail. Well, how come they use that gun against you? Because you had idiot's gun. What's his name? Uh, Pystash's gun, right? Actually, the gun comes from. I found out later Friday. Friday gave the gun to Price Dance. But my stance is they found the gun on me four months after the crime. Yeah. So four months after the crime. So my stance is the gun was purchased from Price Dance. None of the money, none of the vehicle, none of those burglary, none of those things are tied to me. But how much is that gun worth? <laughs> I don't know, man. I mean, I don't know. I've never bought a gun in my life. Probably $120. So you're going to go kill some lady for a gun that's worth $100? Right. A gun. How much did you pay him? Well. Or did you? I did. And so you're listening to it, and you're listening to it, and he's like, you know... Well, this person's asking, well, how can they connect you? Is it the gun? Wasn't that Price Dash's gun? No, I later found out that was actually Frada's gun, and Frada gave it to Price Dash. I mean, so they openly talked about it. Right. And so it was It was very strange. And for the first trial, I believe both confessed to their roles, right. Gidry and Price Dash. I, I think that's correct, yeah. too. Because I remember, I think they even paraded Gidry in during the first trial right. to be uh, identified. So then, but then there was the retrial. The reason he uh, has been uh, was on death row for so long is he won a retrial. My superficial understanding of the legalities is the Criminal uh, Court of Appeals looked at and ruled that Price Dash and Gidry's confessions were taken and they were used during the first trial, but they weren't called as witnesses to testify. Therefore, the defense couldn't cross-examine, mm-hmm. ergo... Those confessions should never have been allowed as allowed in court, ev- evidence. Ev- of course, so he got this new trial in two thousand and nine, and that's I believe right. that's the one you you yeah, covered. We to. And yeah. uh, I had not been at the first one. I was the testimony. I thought was sort of astounding that everybody involved in this was so open about it, and uh, just meaning how many people he had asked every yeah to, for a I, hitman. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, people he well not just that. It, it seemed like every time he went to work out, he had something bad to say about his wife, about how much trouble his wife was, or ex-wife, mm-hmm. how much he wanted to be rid of her. And then uh, it would just be a quick uh, quick jump to, well, you know, I need to get rid of her and start looking for accomplices. Who does that? Who, in the <laughs> yeah. Well, but the other thing is too. He was. You talked about him being a narcissist, and I know we, we, he was a police officer, but he was a he was a weird position that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. He was in Missouri City. He was called a public safety officer, so he was like a right. hybrid police officer firefighter, which was very strange. Yeah. Um, and I remember even during his interrogation the night of the murder. He was coming up with all these cockamamie stories. Well, maybe it's somebody, you know, who I've arrested and da 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 da. And all of the the detective point blank looked at him. He goes, "Why is everybody messing with you? I don't understand. <laughs> you think I do? You know, all I can do is." Oh, just... I noticed that I'm a homicide investigator. I've been in been with for four years now. I worked as a detective for six years before that. I've arrested hundreds, uh, more than two thousand people, and nobody's ever come to my house and messed with me. It's 
been on. You're right. Yeah, I don't know what to say. In other words, they they were like, okay, you say you're a police officer, but you are not. Uh, uh-uh. we are not in the same field. Yeah, and and <laughs> I mean, it was pretty clear uh, from all that. Robert Frada lived in a kind of a different place than most people. Uh, well, he, he fancied himself quite the ladies' man. Well, that. I think he probably, uh, I think Frada thought he was a little more intelligent than the average guy clearly, as well. Clearly. And that he was just going to be able to bull through this. Mm-hmm. Because, like I say, the plan he, I mean, the, the plan he had wasn't much of a plan. No. And it pretty well fell apart about, the, about 10 seconds after police started questioning him about all this. And I think one of the things that struck me, too, is when he left the interrogation the morning after. Yeah. You know, he was all smiles. Not at all. Never had this before. I didn't get to make any phone calls. I didn't get fed until 2 o'clock. I've been under their detention since 9.30 last night. Uh, I was beat. So this has not been a very pleasant experience. Yes, ma'am. Do you have evidence of that? Probably not, no. I mean, they hit you in the you know, chest and kick you in the legs and stuff like that. Who did you one of the sergeants. The only sergeant that was on duty yesterday morning. I asked for a superior officer, but I didn't get one. I was handcuffed to a chair. I cooperated fully. Uh, I mean, I was handcuffed tight. My hand was in blue. I mean, this was pretty ridiculous. And like I said, I'm willing to cooperate fully with everything. Why do you think they believe you did it? Well, if I got shot, I'm sure Far would be the suspect for that. I mean, that to me is, is natural. I was totally understanding about that. I mean, I, I would suspect myself too if I was doing an investigation. That's only natural. Andy Kahn even said this. Victims' yeah. rights have Andy Kahn, he said, the one thing I will never get out of his mind is him smiling into the cameras after that. And you look at that piece of video, and it is. It is disturbing, knowing what you know now in hindsight. You know, yeah. you can't, you can suspect that day. But looking back at him doing that, that smile, less than 24 hours after his estranged wife, the mother of his children, right. was killed execution style. Well, you know, the yeah. impre- I, I remember that. And you may remember it better, but mm-hmm. the impression I think I took away from that was he really enjoyed being on camera. Oh, that he, he clearly was, he was enjoying the attention. He it seems to me that he initiated uh, a couple of uh, sessions with reporters. Yeah, he wouldn't talk stop talking. For, there yeah. was a while in there where you couldn't stop him from talking. Right. Um, and which is interesting because I did put in a request to interview him on death row, right. and he declined. And even. Even some of the prison officials were like, that's kind of surprised us because usually he talks to everybody, but he declined at the end there. Right. Um, I also put in a request to interview Price Dash and Guidry. They also declined because both of them are on death row right. as well, which is a rarity to see three people on death row stemming from the same crime. But Price Dash and Guidry's execution dates have not yet uh, right. been set, but they're, they're on death row as well. So we go to the 2009 retrial, well, and it ended the good. same way. Right. It, you know, he convicted. Yeah. Sentenced to death. I remember in particular speaking with uh, uh, Judy Cox. That was the social worker who supervised the visits between Frada and his children right, right after Farrah's murder. She remained very close with the family, as did Andy Kahn. Yeah. And she said it just, I, I mean, that second trial really took its toll. Because one thing I don't think people realize is the absolute emotional toll that it takes on family members. Because not only do you have that horrible trauma of losing a loved one in an incredibly violent way, but then you have to relive it for the trial. Right. And then you get a retrial, and you have to relive it all over again. And they were terrified. What if the second jury found him not guilty? Right. Would he just literally walk free at that point? And they're thinking about, you know, the three children because the grandparents yeah. adopted the three children and raised them. And it was, it was, it was particularly awful because Farrah's father, Lex Backer, uh, passed away. And... He had talked about how, just how devastating it was that they went through the retrial and he was grateful that he was convicted again and, and sentenced to death again. He never got over it. I just felt so sorry for Lex and Betty having to go through that again. I just lost something that was so precious. She was always my baby. But then I remember Andy Kahn witnessed the execution because he had made a promise to the father. Lex. I, I didn't remember that. Yes. And Andy was there. Yes, okay. yes. Saying that basically Lex said, if I can't be there for the execution. If I cannot be there, will you go? 
in my place because I want to make sure that this actually happens. There are certain cases that deserve the death penalty, and Bob Frada's right at the top of the list. He is an evil, sadistic man. You know, in, you talk about the narcissism with him, even later on as he's on death row, I read some letters that he had written to uh, a print reporter. It wasn't the Chronicle, it was a small like neighborhood newspaper right. that, was, that was covering the case. And even then, he was writing things like, you know, hey, if you lost 10 pounds, you'd be pretty good looking. You know, that guy I mean, it's just like, oh, man. It's like, really? Yeah. You're on death row and I don't know. I just, I don't understand people. I just, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to fathom the depths of that depravity. Yeah, well, he's, uh, <laughs> I, I would say that he's oblivious. Again, it goes mm -hmm. to empathy. Uh, and he doesn't, he, he demonstrated, at least what I saw in court, that he doesn't have much. And he doesn't, it's not that he's ignoring those things that, most average people feel it's he just doesn't they're not on his radar he doesn't uh we don't feel them they don't even suggest themselves you know kind of sympathy i mean they wouldn't you think about the effect that was going to have on your children well that's what i kept saying yeah. I, mean, so, I mean i mean i mean you've got to know that things. you're you're hurting right your children you're going to devastate your children you're causing lifelong trauma right to your children mm. because of this the father but i mean judy cox i mean the father never got over not that any father will ever get over the death or any parent gets over the death of well, the child but just he never yeah, these, never. Thing, these things we're talking about that are so horrific that first of all you kill somebody because you're not getting along with them that's pretty horrific yeah phil thank you for being here yeah it's always great my to pleasure see you. pal always good thank to see you, you. No, it's great to see you too and we thank you for joining us for this episode of the evidence room we're going to be back with a whole brand new season season two at the end of this month in a new location with a whole new list of cases we hope to see you then <laughs>